but I'm getting ready to do an electroshock survey out here for two reasons. Number one, I want to confirm the population density of the fish that survived. Number two, I want to see what did survive. Who better to learn from than someone who has had wild success with growing some of the biggest bluegills ever seen and then also publicly failed? Hello, it's me. Okay? Like I am the one that you wanna learn from. I'm out here doing the things first because someone has to go first. Someone has to see. So we are two months post fish kill out here at the Slab Lab. I know for a fact that some of our copper nose bluegill survived. I know for a fact that some of our shell crackers survived. I have a strong inclination that crappy survived. What does that mean? That means that I have to make some tough decisions when I'm on the front of the shock boat. Let me tell you, post fish kill, when I was out here netting and cleaning out as many fish as I possibly could, I saw a lot of fish that were this big. That led me to believe that we had a very rare total fish kill event. For weeks, Dad and I sat out here. We did put feeders on, um, on some two and three second spins to see if anything would come to feed. And you have to keep in mind, prior to this fish kill, just about every single fish out here knew how to find feed unless they were brand new. Just born, just hatched, too small to sort of leave their area. Majority of the fish out here knew how to take feed. We had zero response when feeding couple of more weeks go by and I physically see some. I see some under the water. It's real hard to make out what they were. They were small. Then dad and I noticed the gambusia were being run off and spooked by something chasing them. It was some small bluegill, but it was also something else. It was crappie. We could roll on with the way that this pond is right now with the fish that we have in here. Why do we not want to do that? Number one, the crappie have already outpaced the surviving bluegill. The surviving bluegill out here are two, three, maybe four inches, maybe. The crappie are five and a quarter inches. They have that hinged jaw, much larger mouth gape. They're tearing up the gambusia out here. They are going to grow and continue to grow much larger than the bluegill. The bluegill will not be able to compete. Crappie would be counterproductive to this program. Not only that, we all know crappie are very prolific and in five acres, crappie are exceptionally difficult to manage, if not impossible. Now, I know a lot of you are probably out there saying, well, you did seven years worth of some of the biggest bluegill that anybody has ever seen with the crappie. They were a hindrance to the program. There's no other way to say it. This is a totally different setting. The stage out here is set with the smallest of fish that survived that last kill. There are no pound, pound and a quarter, two, three, four pound bluegill out here anymore. There are no large tiger bass. None of those big predators survived, okay? So what you've got are these very small bluegill, three months and younger. These fish are the ones that survived. And the biggest thing that you have to think about out here is number one, they are not sexually mature yet. By the time they reach sexual maturity, most likely the water temps would not support a first spawn for those brand new bluegill. The other side of that is you've got crappie that are five and a quarter to six inches already out here. And then guess what happens? They will spawn before any of these remaining bluegill do. You see where I'm going with this? And the surviving bluegill did not have a chance to take root, then what do you have? I'm feeding crappie at that point. One of the things I think that crappie inhibited us from doing the first several go arounds of growing trophy bluegill is the, the growth rate. We know that copper nose are known for growing rapidly in the right conditions. This was one of the biggest downfalls of what we did out here. We had so many crappie because they are so prolific. They took up valuable resources that could have been given straight to those bluegill and they consumed it. So not having that hindrance going forward, we could really show what a trophy copper nose bluegill pond can do. And we can track that in real time. And that's what a lot of, a lot of people don't understand is once we really grasped what we were able to do out here seven years ago and the potential that this had, we were in a pickle, okay? And we had to keep unpickling that pickle. Now we don't have to do that. Now we can start this with all the knowledge, all the failures, all the successes, and we can go back and start this the correct way and really show hard and fast data about what these fish can do. This is a real-time evolving fish story it always has been, but now it's like most important uh, for me to share 
all of the information that I'm number one learning, number two that I'm about to apply out here, all in the pursuit of growing giant bluegill. I mean, there's only one person crazy enough to do this and it would be me. I do believe this is gonna be the most in-depth we've ever gone with growing trophy bluegill. And there are people out there that need to see this. They need to learn from our mistakes. They need to understand where we went wrong so they can avoid that altogether. Rain, rain, rain. At this point in time, the apex predator out here is the crappie. And they are, as I imagine, a lot larger than the bluegills Then I'm going to be left with the decision to reset the pond out here. We are prepared to do that today if that is the decision that I make. So lots of things going on always that slab lab nature you have to be tough to do this and I'm not gonna lie to y'all um, I'm sad I'm sad that this may be something that I will have to do for the very first time ever in slab lab pond history in 30 years we've never had to reset the population of fish out here so I'm gonna share it because I think number one it's important going forward for us to do what we do best and that's remain transparent and honest about the obstacles and challenges that we face out here but i also think it's important because they would be a true detriment to trying to grow giant copper nose bluegill with the way the stage is currently set i have to do this there's no way around it so i'm going to get on the boat here in a little bit and we're going to get to electro fishing and taking a look at their surviving fish the numbers, the average weight, lengths, things like that. So uh, I've prayed a lot over the last couple of days about this. And I know one thing to be true. When I'm on the front of that shock boat, my gut instinct kicks in and I know what I'm supposed to do. So that's what I'm leaning on today. Nobody ever wants to make a tough decision like this. It's what you got to do, man. This is managing in the big leagues and to have an operation like this, we need to get rid of every variable that could cause us to end up in the same position we were in back in July. Here we go. Getting ready to put the boat in so that we can shock survey and see what's left. Small bluegill. We know we've got crappie left. It's going to be a tough shock today thanks to the rain and the pond is about 10 to 11 inches below full pool. It's real muddy out here so Hopefully we can pull this off. There's Sean McNulty with American Sportfish. Getting ready to drive this thing so we can hop on it and do what we need to do. So those long telescopic poles with that weird octopus thing on the bottom, that's where the electric current goes. That electrical current goes into the water and stuns the fish and then they rise to the surface so that you can evaluate them or harvest out what you don't want. There's a live well. Generator, power source, motor, nets. Hook deck boots, you know, PPD. <laughs> This is what I just netted to give you a size comparison. If we do not deal with these crappie, these bluegill will never have a chance to make it, nor will the new fish that we plan to stock in. 